As a monster-struck teenager, our next guest submitted an article to FM which Foreign published in issue 18 entitled Dante's Inferno. Since then, he has made a career making must-see hard flicks, including Small Soldiers, Gremlins, and The Howling. The latter featuring up before yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Dante. <laughs> I, uh, I'm standing here in a place of a lot of people who aren't standing there who are old enough to have been uh, recipients of the first issue of Fancy Monsters. I mean, we all remember where we were when Elvis died and when Patty was shot, and these, this is obviously not quite as important as I meant, but in some ways it is. Uh, we, uh, we all remember where we were when we saw our first issue of Fancy Monsters. Everybody here seems to be able to remember what number it was. DC for me because it was number one. Uh, it was right next to Good Housekeeping, the Ladies Home Journal, the Safeway in Pacific, New Jersey. Uh, and uh, it actually didn't really have such a great cover. I mean, it was a, a busty woman staring up at a guy in a Frankenstein mask. Uh, the covers got better starting with issue three. Issue two's cover was also pretty crappy. Uh, but what was inside was something that we had never seen before, us kids. Now, when I say us kids, you know, the term monster kid has come up, and that's something that we all sort of realized we were later. But at the time, this magazine united a lot of people who didn't know that there were other people like them out there. Uh, and you could call us geeks, or you could call us withdrawn, or what, movie fans, or, or whatever. I'm sure we were all in some way social misfits. But there were others out there like us, and it was a bonding thing that the likes of which really I don't think ever existed before. There was something about it that just made you want to connect with the other people who read the magazine. And uh, sometimes they were in your own high school, and you would actually meet people who were fellow monster fans. But for the most part, the, the trick was to try to get your name in the uh, you, you would write letters. I would write letters. I wrote a lot of letters. I think a lot of us wrote a lot of letters. And the trick was you wrote a letter, and then you got the issue, and you opened it up, and you looked for your name. Uh, obviously, a lot of these letters didn't get printed. I mean, none of mine did. And uh, I came up with all sorts of terrifying ideas for, for <laughs> letters, like the best horror movies I'd ever seen, the scariest scenes I'd ever seen. Finally, I got to the point where I gave, I gave Gloria a list of the worst horror movies I'd ever seen. The only problem was I hadn't seen a lot of them. <laughs> uh, and it turned out later that um, I actually liked a whole bunch of movies that I had put in this thing, but nonetheless, it got printed. And uh, it was printed as an art. And the, I, I got a, this is kind of how far it was, I, I, I got a, a middle envelope uh, in the mail, and it was huge. It had the issue uh, with my article on it, which I didn't even know was there. Uh, John Jason Inferno was called, and he had marked it up, put it all over it, put it all over it, all over it. And, the, uh, and he wrote me a letter, and it was, it was great. I mean, I was walking on a cloud for, you know, years. Uh, but the thing about it, the thing about Famous Monsters that was the most important, I think, from that respect, was that uh, Fari was teaching us film history at a time when uh, certain history that we, we loved was pretty much disparaged as junk. Uh, and uh, silent movies, which is something people didn't give much thought to. There was a TV show called Silent Movies afterward, but for the most part, silence didn't get much attention. Uh, and Far introduced us to the movies of the past, actors who had long since passed away, uh, that we learned to love and appreciate. And it really grew. And as a testament to so many people here who found the magazine of issue 34, issue 35, issue 36, when, they, when frankly some of it had already started to be reprints. But these were people who hadn't seen that stuff before, so uh, it all worked. Uh, I just, I don't know that Fari went to his grave quite realizing the impact that he had. I think he, he, he knew that there were people who loved him and he knew that the, you know, there, there, there had been some sort of influence, but I don't know if he really realized quite how major uh, it was and continues to be. And uh, every time I ever met Fari, it was nothing but gracious and, uh, and wonderful. And of course, his predilection for puns was one of the reasons that we all loved him as a kid. The one thing that all of us have in common, at least those of us who aren't old enough to be uh, contemporaries of Fari's, is that we um, discovered him when we were kids. And that that part of us uh, has stayed with us. And, uh, and 
that was always one of the things about Barr that was the most endearing was that he was, he was very childlike in his writing and in his enthusiasm, uh, and that's why they were so infectious. And uh, I know I'll miss him, and I know all you will too.